Y'all already know what it is, Jay Williams, Let's Live Life, and we're back. Some of the craziest stories dudes told me while locked up. Some of the craziest reasons dudes were locked up. Everything from murder, tractor trailers full of weed, and the list goes on. You know, I done dealt with some, some crazy dudes, I done met some crazy dudes, I done met some good dudes, some bad dudes. For the most part, everybody's got a story. I heard a lot of these stories while I was locked up. Today I'm going to share them with you. Let's relive it. So we're going to start off with a dude, Pakistan. Pakistan's black guy, muscular as hell, man. Dude was super cut up. About 5'11", about pushing 200 pounds. And he was that athletic slash... I lift heavy weights build, if that makes sense. Like, he wasn't just bulky like a bull, like a bulldog. You know what I mean? He was, he was a dude that had good size on him, but he wasn't too big, but he just had that frame. Pakistan got locked up in the early, early 90s. I can't remember if it was 91, 92. Got locked up out in Norfolk, Virginia. And they called him Pakistan because in gun, in, in the streets, he was known for Shooting them guns off. He was known for letting them go in broad daylight. He had a couple bodies. He would mow your ass down. Hence is the name Pakistan. And over Pakistan, they just got kids running around with AK-47s. People just shoot off all day long. So it's a war zone. So Pakistan, like I told you, been locked down since, since the early 90s. He didn't look like somebody... That was his age. And the thing a lot of y'all don't get that when it comes to prison, prison will preserve you. You don't usually see nobody go in jail or prison and come out worse shape than they went in. You just send a, a, a crackhead, a dope fiend, somebody really skinny in prison, and they come out with some weight on them. Now, everybody will complain about the food. No, the food's not good. It's not meant to be good. But one thing about it is they're going to feed you three meals a day. The average person doesn't eat three meals a day. Most of y'all watching do not eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. You will do that while incarcerated. So Pakistan had been stripped of, you know, all the drugs that everybody else was doing in the streets, just like all the rest of us. He wasn't eating red meat all day. Didn't have the option of drinking 740s every day. So he was healthy. And as I said, it preserves you. Well, every year we would hear Virginia laws are changing. They're about to come back in with the 30 for 30 good time, meaning for every 30 days you do, you get 30 days off. And then they're going to bring back to 65%, meaning you only have to do 65% of your time instead of 85. Pakistan is up in his cell one day. And I dealt with dude here and there. He wasn't nobody that was like one of my everyday dudes I kicked it with. But I dealt with him here and there. Every now and then I stopped by. What's up, Pakistan? We chop it up, blah, blah, blah. Go back about my business. Might say what's up to him once a day and keep it moving. Well, he calls me up to his cell one day. And he's, you know, got this piece of paper. And he's got all these math equations scribbled on it. And he's trying to figure out that if these new laws go in effect, when will he be able to be released? So... He's telling me, you know, he's, he's done this, he's done that, and this is what he's come up with. And he's excited about the number that he's come up with. With his calculations, he could be out of prison in his late 80s. Dude was in his 20s when he got locked up. He's got well over 100 years, didn't get a life sentence. But sometimes they'll sentence you to, I know guys that got 300 years. 600 years, almost a thousand years, but nowhere does it say life sentence. It just has numbers. They know there's no possible way you can do that amount of time, right? So he's telling me, he's like, yeah, I can be out, man. I'm, I think I'm going to be 87, 88 with the new law. I can, I can get out. I can get out. I'll be out one day. And he's kind of, you know, stoked about it. And it's sad in a sense. Because at him being 87, 88, all he's looking at is that he will eventually one day step out of prison. 
the law ended up not going into effect. Nothing changed. So Pakistan is still coming home in a bag. So we get to bullshit one day. We get to talking, chopping it up. And that's how I found out about his name, you know, how you got your nickname or whatnot. This is Pakistan's Pakistan story. Pakistan told me, he said, at this time in my life, I was moving a lot of drugs. He said, but the drug game had slowed up. There was a drought on coke. We had dudes going to New York, Maryland, D.C., different places, all the way down to Florida, picking up coke because something had happened. Something got too off along the way, and there was a shortage here in VA. He said, so rather than just sit around waiting on coke to come in, I started robbing dudes. He said, now the dudes I'm robbing aren't just your everyday dudes. He said, I'm robbing dudes that I know that got money, dudes that got large amounts of money that are trying to get coke. I'm robbing drug dealers, and this is starting to be, he said, it started to become something I liked. Like, I liked the power of running up on six people, having a Mac-10 on a shoestring, laying everybody down, taking all that money. He said, you know, to be honest, I started making more money from robbing drug dealers than I did through selling coke. So he said one night he gets into it with some dudes, man. He goes, he's trying to creep up on these dudes to rob these dudes and some other dudes. See him creeping. He's coming through an alleyway. They let off shots at him. He said, so he, you know, takes cover, takes his Mac out that he had and just lets it go. Bow, 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 bow. Sprays at him, right? So he got up out of there, got back to his whip. But now... He's known for robbing. Everybody knows what his car looks like. Everybody knows who he is. Everybody knows who he's robbed. Dudes he shot. He didn't say if he killed him. He said dudes I had shot. So I'm guessing dudes he just popped during the commission of the robbery, right? So he's going through these projects out in Norfolk. And it said it's not project buildings, it's houses. He said it's probably 6.30 seven o'clock at night he said now i've been drinking the night before he said i woke up that morning and i was sick like hung over bad so my homeboy you know he said he told me yo just start drinking some more man get back to drinking you'll feel better he said that's what i did he said you know rather than go eat something i need to get some water in my system to help with the hangover <clears throat> he said i grabbed the bottle of liquor i just started drinking so this is first thing in the morning. He said, now you roll around 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. He said, I've been drinking all day heavy. He said, I don't want to get pulled. I know I got some warrants for some robberies and stuff. So I got my homeboy driving the car. He said, I'm in the passenger seat. He said, I never should have went out this night. I should have just stayed home. I was too messed up. He said, we go to this neighborhood. And there's this one section of dudes he knew out there that hustled that he was going to rob. Like I told you, he said, I was too faded, but I went anyway. He said, as they pull into the neighborhood, they're creeping, trying to find out what block these dudes are standing on. They see the dudes on a block down the street, circle the block, come back up, and head towards them. Well, as they're heading towards the dudes, the dudes see them. The dudes start shooting at his car. And they take off running through yards in different directions, right? So he said his homeboy hit the gas, said he's got the window all the way down. And then he said, man, they shot at me. So, you know, I'm trying to lay him down. I'm shooting back. He said they're, they're going down this street and these boys are jumping fences, running. He says oh, it's a group of them, like seven, eight dudes. And some of them are together and they're like, some of them are running down the sidewalk. Some are cutting through yards. He said and they passed his house and the dudes are cutting through the front yard to go to the side. And he said he come out the window with the Mac and just open fire. Doom, 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 doom. Let's the gun, you know, just ride. Let's the clip off. Said he sees the one dude drop. The other dude hit the fence, kept running. They circle the block. He's trying to get another magazine out. But like I told you, said he's so messed up that he, he can't really function. He can't get the other Mac, the other magazine to go into the Mac. So he just tells his homeboy, pull off, pull off. The car's been shot a bunch of times. 
He said he didn't know if he had killed dude. He said for the next few days, he was kind of paranoid. And then his homeboy hits him up and says, hey, you need to turn the news on. And you need to watch the news. Man. You need to, you know, just watch the news. So he said that night, he turns the news on, he watches. And his face pops up on the news. His car pops up, his plate numbers, all that. He had killed the one boy that was running through the yard. And killed two old people sitting on the, like the front patio of their house that were trying to run into the house to get away from the gunfire that was taking place in the neighborhood. So here it stands. He's wanted for the murder of the one dude in the yard and this old couple killed the man and the woman. He went on the run, went to Baltimore, said he was in Baltimore for a while out there hustling, doing his thing. And he got picked up by some undercovers. Said he served an undercover one night out on a block. Undercover cop pulled up, asked if he had any coke, crack, whatever he was selling at the moment. He served him. He said before he knew it, cars pulled up all around him. Lights on, get on the ground. They search him. By now, he's got a different gun. They catch him with the gun. Run his name. They got him locked up, you know, down in Baltimore. And all his charges here in Virginia come back. Well, him having these murder charges here in Virginia and having a Coke and a gun charge, you know, in Baltimore, it would mean that since he got arrested there first, he would have to do the time for the gun and, the, you know, the distribution, the sale to an officer, the controlled by before he could be shipped back here to Virginia to start doing his time. So Baltimore agrees they're going to drop the gun charge, they're going to drop the drug charge, and they're going to let Virginia prosecute him. Virginia swoops in, picks him up, brings him back, and he ends up getting sentenced to a long ass time. Man. I think I think he had somewhere on the lines about 100, 150, I think it was like 150 years is what he ended up getting. When I met him, I didn't, I didn't know he had all that time. He didn't really carry himself like a guy that had a life sentence. Because even though they didn't tell him life, they didn't say, we sentenced you to life. When they give you 100 years, 80 years, 60 years, that's a life sentence. By the time you're done doing that amount of time, you ain't got much life left if you make it out. So he was excited to tell me about the possibility of him coming home at 87 years old. After he told me the story of what happened, I still talked to him, still dealt with him, but I didn't look at him the same. You know what I mean, and he told me like, he was like, he didn't know that he had hit these, this, these two senior citizens, these two old people. That were just sitting out on their porch, sun going down, enjoying each other's company, been married a very long time, lived in this house before this neighborhood became the projects and riddled with drugs. You get a lot of people like that, that just, this is my home. I'm not moving. They mind their business. And then all this crime goes on around them. Well, that was this couple. They're out on the porch. God knows doing what, man, drinking coffee, maybe a glass of tea, maybe having a cigarette, maybe just talking, you know. But he said, I didn't know. I've never even seen the people. He didn't get into whether the porch was screened in or whatever. He just said they were sitting on a porch. And that when he opened fire, they, like both of them tried to hurry up and get in the house, and he ended up shooting both of them. Crazy, crazy things, man. That's why you need to always think about what you do before you do it. We got youngins running around right now, popping these guns, squeezing these triggers, that if you were to sit six beer cans on a fence, most of them couldn't hit one out of six, but they'll aim a gun and open fire, claiming that they're trying to hit somebody, only to end up pulling a Pakistan, hitting one out of like eight, and killing two people that had nothing to do with it. Crazy, crazy. Now, I don't know if you keep up with the news. But recently, it has been agreed 
that Virginia will become the first Southern state to legalize marijuana. It's a good thing. People say, ah, oh, you know, weed is a drug, is this and that. If alcohol is legal, and alcohol is by far one of the most dangerous things you can get your hands on, there's no reason weed shouldn't be legal. I could smoke $20 worth of weed I still function, still drive my car. I go get a $20 bottle of liquor, I'm gonna be slumped. Good chance I'm a wreck or get a DUI. So I'm cool with the fact that, you know, they're legalizing weed here in Virginia, that's a good thing. With them legalizing weed, there is going to be a lot of different people that are gonna end up being released from prison because whether you realize it or not, and I know this to be 100% facts, there are guys sitting in prison right now that have been in prison for a very long time for large amounts of weed. Today I'm going to tell you one of these guys' stories, man. It's messed up, but it's kind of, it's just, it's a crazy story all the way around the board. I don't remember the dude's name. I couldn't, if I had to guess it, or who wants to be a millionaire, I go home broke, man, because I can't I can't remember dude's name. But he was a cool old white guy. Cool as hell, man. Reminded you of like like your drunk uncle or something. You know what I mean? He always had a story to tell. And he liked telling his story. He was broke. Super broke. Didn't never get no money from nobody. I never really seen him get no visits or nothing, right? So he'd hustle up little stuff, come by myself, can I get a shot of coffee? I can't pay it back, man, but I appreciate it. And when dudes like, you know, come by every now and then for something like that, I don't mind helping out. I'm just not going to take you to rage. You know what I mean? So we're sitting out in the, in the day room one time and they've been talking about, you know, legalizing weed forever now. This is something I've been hearing since I was a teenager. And he's telling me, man, they need to hurry up and legalize weed so I can go home. And before we get into it, I don't know how much time he got that I don't remember. I know it was a lot. It was double digits, you know, a lot of time. So I said, uh, you can go home if they legalize weed. And he was like, yeah, if they change the laws, he's like, I'm in prison because of weed. I hadn't heard of many people that were doing a long time like him for weed. I'd heard of dudes that got caught with 10, 20 pounds that, you know, got five years, six years, whatever, 10 years. So he goes on to tell me his story. He says, I was a truck driver. He said, and this is back then, you know, we had the CBs and I would drive all across the nation. He said, I had teenage kids at home. One was like 19, another one was, you know, a little bit younger, maybe 16, 17. He said, me and my wife had split up. My boys were fine at home. You know, I had a, a girlfriend back in town that I would see when I was in town. He said, but I would hit the road. And being a truck driver, sometimes I might be gone for weeks at a time. So he tells me, he says, he's out west and he's doing his deliveries. He said, and then at the nighttime, you know, he could either get back on the road, but sometimes he would either sleep in the cab of his truck or he'd get a hotel room. He said he didn't really like to drink in his truck because, you know, there's... He gets caught with an open container or something like that. He can lose his CDL, and that's his career. He said, so he's out west. I believe he was in Cali, he told me. And he's in a bar one night, and he's drinking. And he's got his truck parked next door where the motel is, alongside, you know, taking up a lot of space. And he's talking to one of these guys at the bar, and they're like, hey, is that your truck outside? And he tells him, yeah, that's that's my truck. And they're like, so, you know, okay, you drive big trucks and whatnot. One thing leads to another. The guys he's talking to are weed dealers. These are guys that distribute lots of weed. More weed than probably any of us have ever seen. Not 10 pounds, not 100 pounds. You're talking thousands of pounds of weeds, of weed these guys got access to, right? So he said um, they gave him his number, 
gave them gave him their number and was like, if you ever want to make some serious money, some real money, and do some hauling for us, take some of these containers, you know, back to the East Coast, drop them off, and we'll pay you. You'll make great money, way more than what you're making, you know, hauling produce and furniture, whatever you got on your truck. He said he took the guy's number and everything, put it in his wallet, went about his business. It's a couple months, man. He said, he said, I think it was like four or five months that went by. Here he is. He's back out in Cali. He's dropped off his load. He's about to take his truck and head back to Virginia. He said he gets to thinking about the conversation he had with the guys in that bar that night. He says, fuck it. I'm going to give him a call see what they're talking about. So he calls the guys up. They agree to meet with him, go over the details and everything. They're giving this man a tractor trailer full of weed to drive from the West Coast here to the East Coast. They've got it packaged. They got other things in the truck to conceal what's in there. He said, now the problem is you gotta go through weigh stations. You can't, the truck weighs too much. They'll check it sometimes. You know, there might be police there with dogs. He said, so it's, it's a risky, risky thing to do, but he's been driving long enough that he knows for the most part, how to get back from the west to the east safely when certain weight stations will be open and closed, how to avoid detection. He said, he's been doing this a long time. He's like, I know the roads like the back of my hand. I know these way stations. I know a lot of these state troopers, you know, I'm a man of the road. He meets with them somewhere. He didn't tell me where. He said he met with them somewhere and he backed his truck up. He has them hook up, you know, he hooks up to this, this trailer full of all this weed. They give him a bunch of money up front. And then when he gets it to where he's taking it and unloads it, just unhooks the trailer and pulls forward, he'll get paid the rest of his money. Said he does this several times. He said over a course of two or three years. He had made several runs and that it wasn't really paranoid when doing it because, you know, it never, never had no problems. He would always go to the same place, pull through the same big fence up to the same warehouse, back up, unhook his load, pull over to the side. They come pay him a bunch of thousands of dollars and he would pull off. He said he's coming through with a load one time and he's headed to the same spot he's always been headed to. He said he had the cell phone in a bag. Remember the bag phone, the leather case? A lot of y'all ain't never seen this, but before we had cell phones, it was a big black leather bag that you could plug into your cigarette lighter. And it was almost like a house phone with a cord on it. And you could make calls. Said he's probably an hour away from where he's got to drop this trailer off. And the phone rings. Answers the phone and it's the guys that he does business with out west. That I've given him the tractor trailer. They tell him, make the trailer disappear. Make it disappear. Make it disappear. Feds, cops, everybody, they've raided the warehouses. If you pull up with this tractor trailer, you're going to get caught. They're there. We've already been notified. A lot of people are going to jail. If you go down that street with that tractor trailer, they're 100% looking and they're going to, you know, they're going to tear you off. You're going to prison. So he said he freaks out. Like, Man, what the hell do I do with this trailer? What do I do with this trailer? So at the time, he's living in Virginia, but he's living out in the country. Said he takes the trailer to his house. Said he backs it into his driveway. Backs it up behind it, you know, his house. Says there's a lot of land back there. Backs down towards the woods and stuff. Said he had old pickup trucks, old farm equipment, a big-ass barn and all this shit. For the most part, he makes the trailer disappear. He said the smell, even though it's supposed to be wrapped up, they didn't have the same ways of hiding smell like we do now with these seal tight bags. He said the smell was just overwhelming. He said, and I smoke, you know, he called it grass. He said, I smoked some grass here and there. He said, now this number I'm calling that they called me from to tell me the place had been raided it's out of service. 
I have no way to get in touch with these dudes that this trailer belongs to and wait for somebody to contact me. Nobody does. He's like, months have gone by now. I've got this damn tractor trailer hidden in my backyard, full size tractor trailer down by the woods on, on the, on the wood line, just sitting full of weed. He said, so I said, fuck it, man. He said, I went out there and I popped the tag on the trailer, climbed up in there, looking at all this weed that they had boxed up. Said his teenage son, the younger one, not the 19 year old, but the younger one had come up and seen what was in the trailer. Son's, oh shit, let me get some, let me get some, let me get some. He said, so, you know, I smoked with my boys. My boys knew what it is. He said, I gave them a little bit. I took a little bit. We didn't get greedy. Just took a couple hands full. Went on about our business, right? He said, I'd be out of town. Once again, driving my truck. About a month later, when I get a call from somebody here in Virginia saying, you need to come home. There are police everywhere. They're at your house. You need to get home. Both your sons are in custody. Their house has been raided. Get home. He said he knows that in heading home, that whole tractor trailer full of weed is out back. That's got to be why they're there. He's like, we don't do anything else. I didn't really break no, no laws other than that, which is a, a big no-no. His son... His teenage son had went up in this tractor trailer when his pops wasn't looking and took this big ass brick of weed. He said it must have been two, three pounds compressed in a saran wrap. His son is wanting to stunt. His son is showing everybody this weed. His son is smoking with everybody, just chiefing all day long. Somebody tells on the son. Son gets pulled over. They're sitting in the car as this two, three pound brick in the back, covered up with some laundry, some clothes. You can't hide the scent of, you know, three pounds of weed in the back seat, especially once it's opened. The son goes ahead and, you know, admits that, yeah, they the dog hits on the car. They already know when they pull him what they're looking for. And the son tells them, Man, it's not, it's, it, I got it from the house. I got it from the house. The son straight told that the stuff was at the house. The cops go there and discover this entire tractor trailer full of weed parked in this man's backyard. He finally comes back from off the road. They lock him up, charge him with all these drugs, all this weed. And broke his ass off with a whole bunch of time. Because back then, they looked at, you know, weed like it was just terrible. I mean, they were classifying weed and sending people to weed, to jail and prison for weed on a daily basis. And I met this man, you know, mid-2000s. And he had been locked up. Probably working on 15, 20 years. All... Behind a truckload of weed. So the good thing is. And yeah he wasn't no bad dude man. He was an old dude. Cool dude. With the laws changing. I'm not sure if the legalization of weed. Will. Get him released from prison. I think it should play a part in it. I don't think he should have got all that time for weed. But hopefully with the laws changing. He'll be let up out of prison. He'll probably never be able to drive a track trailer again. But at least he'll have a chance to live in some of his life before he dies. And not dying because he had a track trailer full of weed. Crazy, crazy things. So I had a couple more stories I was going to tell y'all today. There's so many of them, man. It's just... And thinking about it, so many stories. It's enough content, it feels like, forever. But I'm going to cut it short. We got a lot going on here on the job site. We got siding going up today, windows going in, painting cabinets, electrical, all these different things. So you already know I got to get on my grind. But anyway, these prisons, detention centers, these facilities, these jails, they're all just 
crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And as always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching. Because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do. Salute.